Hi everyone, this is Sean. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about arm security and what characteristics of a gun should you consider when purchasing the firearm for arm security work. This video is designed for those of you who are newer to firearms. Maybe you never even held a gun in your life before. This is for a newer crowd. Now, if you find this video helpful, please do not hesitate to forward this video to somebody else, somebody who might benefit from it. And I, and I promise I will keep politics out of this video so that you feel comfortable sending this to anybody that can benefit from it. So YouTube has a new policy, and it actually has been my policy, to always make sure that you're operating in a safe environment, you're showing firearms in a safe environment. So before I started the video, I made sure that all three of my firearms are safe, there are no magazines in the well, and there is no live round in the chamber. I did a visual and a physical inspection of all my firearms here. And I know it's kind of hard to see the chamber this video maybe I'll bring it a little bit close but they're all inspected and they're all safe okay let's talk about the rules what's what's the the regulations well number one follow your company policy follow follow the law some security companies might give you more leeway on the type of firearm that you can carry and that's great but num the number one thing that when you look for is is there a holster for the type of firearm that you intend to carry? This is a level two retention holster. As you can see here, and I'll show you where the level two comes from. So the level one, the level one is simply the screws here create the tension. They kind of vise the gun a little bit but just that tension keeps the gun secured. Okay, I could put it upside down. With a little bit of force, well actually a lot of force, this thing will eventually come out, but that's level one. Level two retention is a locking hood. Every holster, every holster that you have, if you, if you are gonna be carrying in an exposed environment, exposed carry, meaning the public is gonna see your firearm you should have at least a level two holster. Some people say level three, that's also fine. But my, re my personal recommendation is level two. If you wanna carry level three, that, that's gonna require a lot of reputations as well. Uh, you will be safer, but I've never in my life carried a level three, always a level two. And that's just a pers personal pre preference. Level three just means that you have to do something else to release the firearm from the holster. Maybe that there's another latch, um, or some type of other lever that you have to press. Now I can't show you a level three holster because I don't own one. Now the reason why you look for a holster first is because if you have one of those rare exotic guns, they might not fit in every holster. So I do have a Staccato P Duo. What that is is it's a double stack 1911. I don't have it with me right now, but that gun will not fit in every holster. You gotta make sure that they have the holster first. And I'll just give you a prime example. So if you want to carry this MMP shield exposed, right? I don't know why you'd carry this. You would need a level two holster, okay? And I can't think, I can't, it's very difficult to find a level two holster for the shield, okay? This is obviously not going to fit. If you put a loaded firearm in a, in a holster that's not designed for it, you're going to get an accidental discharge, okay? And that's, that's, that's not going to be a, a good day. Make sure that the holster fits for the, fits the gun, fits the exact gun. So that's number two. Now number three is try to look for a firearm that has at least, uh, at the very least, a four inch barrel. Your, this is a Glock 22. This has a 4.49 inch barrel. I'm not too sure what the dimensions are on the Springfield XD. This is a 45 caliber. I don't know what the dimensions are, but I'm almost sure it's it's more than a four inch barrel. The MMP9 shield, this has a 3.1 inch barrel. Try to go for between four inch and five inch. And why is that? Well, it's easier to find a holster, okay? And it, the, 
the gun's going to be a lot more easier to control when it recoils. And you're going to get a lot more accuracy as well if you stick with the dimensions. I had, a, I had a combat marine in one of my other exposed permit carry classes. And um, he was asking if he could qualify with his M&P 2.0. It, it was a sort of a subcompact sub version. Well, I call it subcompact because it looks subcompact, but it was a compact version. And it, the barrel length was 3.6 inches, I believe. And at first I thought, well, that's not a bad, that's, that's a bad idea because it's not within 4 inches to 5 inches. And he seemed to have a hard time finding a holster. But then he showed me his hands. And by the way, this, this guy has been in combat um, using an M9. So he knows what the real world is like. He knows what he needs in order to save his life but anyhow um, he showed me his hands and his his hands were really short but with and this is not a 3.6 inch barrel as i just mentioned this is a this is a mnp shield um his hands he was able to wrap around completely okay just like this but when I gave him one of these, this is Glock 22, his his hands or fingers were so short, um, he would ha he would need to reposition his grip significantly, okay, in order in order to even reach the trigger here. So in that circumstance, it's fine. But I did tell him, hey, and I don't think at that time he he found a level two holster. Um, I said, hey, as long as you find a level two holster, I don't think any employer is going to have much reservations, but. You know, I'm not going to be your, your your future employer. Okay. Another thing that we need we need to look at is the gun that we need should have a pick and tee rail, and I'll show you what that is in a minute here. This shield right here, this shield. Actually, this is a substandard pick and tee rail. I, I wouldn't mount anything on it. I wouldn't trust that. Um, I'll show you the the Glock. This right here. See the grooves? This is a pick and derail. This allows me to mount a light source, okay, right onto here. Okay, there are guns that come without this. I would not buy a gun, a pistol for duty purposes that does not have a pick and derail. You're not going to be able to attach a light source. Now, you might be asking me, Sean, why do I need a light source? Well, you need to be able to identify your target, even if you work armed security. In the daytime, you might have to enter a warehouse that maybe maybe you got a call that some guy was acting suspiciously by the electrical box, shut the electricity off, and then went inside the warehouse. And your hands-on security company, and they want you to go over there and look for this person. Um, they want you to do that before before you call the police. Now you shouldn't search a building by yourself, but let's just say for some reason you need to get. To, from point A to point B, and you decide that you need to search this building or at least a, a significant amount of portion of it, um, you're gonna need a light source. Now you can hold a light with one hand. You know, there are methods to, there are met, methods to illum, illuminating the unknown with having one hand on the gun and the other with the light source here. I mean, there are methods. It's kind of hard for me to show you guys this on camera because I don't have a lot of area where I can move from. But this is this is one of the techniques. Okay, we have the FBI technique, just like this, and then the the Harry's technique, just like this, bone against bone. This is actually a topic for another another video. That's a technique. But when you fire the first. Uh, when you fire the first shot, getting the second shot on target might become a little bit of a hassle. You're not going to be as effective if you have, as if if you had light source on the rail. And unfortunately, a while back I learned the hard way. Now I can't disclose um, what I've done and not what I've done and have not done in the past. And that's a topic for a book that I will probably end up releasing in about eight and a half years from now um, but I've, I've I've had some experiences we'll put it as that so 
that's the thing. Um, definitely need a gun with a light source. As for sights, you need to have night sights on your gun, very minimum. On this shield, and I keep I keep showing you the shield. Remember, this is this is for concealed carry. I would not use this as a as a duty weapon unless you're working executive protection. Then I would I'd probably consider it. But this is th this gun here has night sights, and at night or in darkness they'll start glowing. This front sight right here will be more pronounced. I know you see the orange, uh, but right here in the middle will be glowing, and then you have the two sights right here the two rears and they'll glow also to give you a night uh, they'll give you a, a good sight picture you'll be able to align your sights on target if you have time in the def in, in in a defensive encounter and your shots will be more accurate than if you didn't have any sights on there so you need the night sights um, as we progress throughout time right now I see a lot of people having the red dot sights and this is what I highly recommend. Um, get a name brand one. Get Holosun. Get Trijicon. Get, um, what's the other one? The Loophold. Okay, get a, get a known brand. Uh, Vortex also makes um, good red dots. But what I like about the red dot site is that, you, that you're more target focused. And all you're doing is imposing a red dot, superimposing a red dot on your target or the threat. And the good thing about doing so is that you could focus more on the actions of that of the threat. Now, having a red dot sight requires a significant amount of training. You can do you can train on your own, but for me, it it, it took a two day red dot instructor course in order for me to feel proficient with the red dot. And, and results are going to vary, but you definitely need to get some type. You should get some type of training um, if you're going to carry a red dot optic on your on your on your on your on your pistol and it has to be mounted properly so we talked about the barrel size okay between four inch and five inch we talk about the holster we talked about having a white light um, we talked about having the pick and rail so we can attach the white light too another thing i want you to keep in mind is when you buy the holsters um if i take some holsters will only accommodate the gun if the light is attached to it. So I'll give you an example. So this is my Glock 22, and this is designed for duty purposes, by the way. Um, I did a complete video on why I have every single um, why I have every single object on here in slide cut. I did a, I did a complete video on that. I'll leave a link in the description below also. But anyhow, uh, with this holster okay it's, it's not designed to hold um a gun without the light without the white light see how easy it just falls out so that's also something to keep in mind buy a holster that's able to accommodate the white light and the gun okay and you can't you can't just say well let me get a holster that doesn't accommodate the white light and later on want to carry a gun with a light on it because then you have to get a brand new holster Let's talk about name brands. Pretty much any law enforcement agency out there, especially larger agencies, um, whatever gun they're carrying, consider what they have. The larger agencies like Los Angeles Police Department, New York Police Department, FBI, U.S. Customs, the larger agencies, even marshals, they have full-time firearm instructors. Now, I'm not a full-time firearm instructor. I'll be the first to admit that. But they have full-time firearm instructors, and they constantly see what guns are coming on the range and which ones are having problems. And they're able to give recommendations to the department executive, but their input matters. They're on the range const constantly. The sheriff's departments also, they have a lot of them have um, full-time range masters. So whichever gun they have, I would highly consider. Now just to throw some names out there, we have SIG, we have Springfield, we have Glock, and what else? We have Breda. Bretas are good guns as well. And if I forgot to mention your gun, please in the description, not description box, in the comment box, please comment on what gun you have and let us know whether, whether or not you 
you like the gun, the gun or not. Okay. Now, one last consideration um, with any gun you're you're trying to look at in purchasing is see if you have a full grip on the gun. So this gun right here, the Glock 22. Okay, I'm able to get a full grip. You see that? Full purchase. Look at the bottom. See, see that? See how much more room I have? I have all this room here. The more grip you're able to have on the gun, the more control you're able to have on it. But, but see how much grip I have. Now, this is a this is a Gen 4, and this is Gen 3 slide. This is a Gen 3 slide that's made it on a Gen 4 frame. I did a video on this also, by the way. Uh, but with the Gen 4 and above, you're able to change out the back strap to your fittings. Now, if you have a Gen 3 Glock and and previous years, or uh, Gen 1, 2, or 3, there's nothing you can change out. Um, you could put the sleeve on here. I don't recommend, actually, you don't put any type of sleeve device on any of your guns. It might slip when you actually need it. But um, Gen 1, 2, and 3, you can't change. And the the hands, I'm sorry, the, the grips, they're a lot more bulkier and bigger. And it's with Glock, Gen 1, 2, and 3 is not one size fits all. Um, everybody is built differently, and I think some law enforcement agencies are starting to realize that, and even security companies. So make sure that you're able to wrap your hand around the grip just like this. Okay, you have a lot, you have a lot more purchase left here, and you're able to get the support hand and made it around right here. Okay, so it should look something like something something like this. Okay, let me show you what. You shouldn't get for exposed carry. So this is this is the shield, okay. And you see all this area that's left right here, okay. The the gun's gonna recoil, and you're gonna see a lot of muzzle flip with this, okay. It, it's it's really difficult to get a, a nice grip on on this one right here. Um, but this is not meant this is not meant for exposed duty purposes. There's a lot of 1911 fans out there. You guys, if if you train with the 1911, only 100 rounds, and then you think you can carry it for duty purposes, unless the gun is a is a Nighthawk, um, even a, or even a Staccato, um, a Dan Wesson, but especially a Nighthawk, I, I wouldn't put my life to that gun. You're you're gonna need to test it. Um, I do. I did a significant amount of firearms training this year. And it seems like every gun that fails out there is a 1911. So just make sure that you get the rounds in. Um, a 10 to 500 round course, 300 round course, 1,000 round course out there. If you if you if if you're hell bent on carrying 1911, make sure that you're not you're getting very few malfunctions. Um, the only other drawback with a 1911 um, pistol is the safety. What we're seeing in these classes is. We have students that forget to um, disengage the safety, or sometimes they don't have they don't have a full grip. So on a 1911 style pistol, you have a grip safety. They're not getting the full grip, and they're the safe the the safety hasn't been activated. I'm sorry, the safe the, the the safety hasn't been released, so they can't fire their gun. Okay, so that's something you have to consider. The 1911, you got you have to train with it. You train with it enough then you can bring it out there to the field so that's all i have let me know what your comments are your concerns what type of gun are you carrying and also what caliber if you have any requests for any future videos please don't hesitate to ask